Matthew 26. <clears throat> Last week, we're on Wednesday, we're in the book of James, and we're about to close down on that book. Last time we were in James 5.12, and we studied the doctrine in, of invoking the name of God. In that study, we mentioned this passage uh, where Jesus is uh, in his second trial before the Supreme Court of Israel, Caiaphas being the high priest of Sanhedrin, and this idea came up in the word adjure. So I'm in uh, 59. Well, let's just pick it up at 57. If you have a study Bible, you'll see that. And those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together gathered together with the high priest as the Sanhedrin, or what we would call in our day the Supreme Court of Israel. Peter also following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. This is actually a, an illegal gathering court. Notice they gathered in the courtyard of the high priest. The chief, now the chief priest, plural, and the whole council, now we have the Supreme Court, kept trying to obtain false witnesses against Jesus in order that they might put him to death. But they could not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward in other words, they couldn't hold up under any kind of test. But later on, two came forward that they thought they could work in the system. And these two witnesses said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Jesus Christ, Do you make no answer? because Jesus has been silent through the trials. Jesus kept silent. The high priest demanded, I adjure you, that's really important, by the living God, he's the only one that could say this, that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. You've spoke the truth today yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand. If you've got a study Bible, he's, he's quoting Psalms 110.1. He's sitting at the right hand of, God, of power. And now he quotes Daniel 7.13, if you have a study Bible and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes. That's forbidden in Mosaic law to do that. I'll show it to you. It's forbidden. And said, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? In other words, he's been his own witness against himself. They never heard the two witnesses he called. How many witnesses did they call that they finally consented to put in court? Two. How many witnesses did he call? I just told you. Who were they? David, Psalms 110.1. And Daniel, Daniel 7.13. So you, you got to really pay attention to this stuff. In verse 66, the high priest says, what do you think? 
and the court unanimously, he's deserving of death. Then they did something illegal. They spat in his face. They We call it spit. In his face, beat him with their fist, and others slapped him and mocked him, saying, prophesy to you, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that hit you? Okay? So much for a day with the Supreme Court. Now, what the high priest did, of course, he doesn't care about law, does he? No. He, he broke every possible law that you could imagine. Over 60 laws that he broke. Yeah. He must have been Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> well, they weren't law-abiding. <laughs> So what the high priest did when he said, I adjure you, is he, he brought into the court legitimately the Urim oath. The Urim and the Thum is what the high priest had along with the breastplate under Mosaic law. And this is called the Urim oath when he said, I adjure you, and I put the Greek word for it, by the living God that you tell us, meaning the truth, because the Urim oath, we did it. Listen, you know, we're in America. Do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so helps you God? Remember that? That's the Urim oath. In American cult system, that's where that came from. That whole concept, that's where it came from. That's what he's saying here to this. <coughs> and when you swore in court to this oath, you were liable to God. Now remember, this is important now, remember that the priest nation court system is a theocracy governing. It's a theocracy government. There's no monarchy, right? There won't be another monarchy until the second coming of Christ. Right? The curse of Coniah. Mm -hmm. Their operation is back to a theocracy operation. That's very important. You know that. Of course, they're controlled by Rome. Rome, they're subject, subject to Roman authority and power. Rome rules over them. They're not going to be able to give him a death penalty. They've got to go get Pilate, who represents the supreme rule of Rome, to sign off on this before they can put him to death because Rome didn't let you put anybody to death without their consent. They don't have any teeth in this law. Hopefully, they're going to be able to take him to Pilate, put pressure on Pilate to kill him. The other thing is the way they mocked him. Now, they violated everything. They, they spit in his face. They beat him with a fist. They all took turns slapping on him and mocked him in court. And they mocked him. Watch, I'm going to show you evil, how evil works. They mocked him on the very thing the populace of Israel believed, all of them believed one thing to be true about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet sent from God. They would have put this man to death. They had assassination attempts out to murder him and couldn't get to him. And the primary reason they couldn't get to him 
is that the populace of the Israelites believed he was a prophet sent from God. So when they mock him, look, they're mocking what the populace of the people believe with all of their heart, that Jesus was a prophet come sent from God to them. They believe that. Now, whether he's the Messiah or not, they're, they're, up, they're up for grabs on that. But no one in Israel except this group Everybody believed he was a prophet sent from God to them. This mock really shows you how deep evil can get into your... And listen, listen to me. When this kind of evil gets into your court system, your nation is <clears throat> sunk. I mean, what we've got to do with this president is put people back in judicial positions who believe in the Constitution of the United States of America, and they're willing to spread, to give their blood for it. Because that's what the rest of us do. We swear allegiance to the flag, and our blood flows because of it, and that is all about our Constitution. And listen, this group of people had the perfect Constitution. I mean... Absolutely 100% perfect, right? It shows you how evil people can be. What they did is so evil. And it's in the supreme court of the land that this group of people have got control of. We need to really understand where we need to focus our prayers. We need to get our court system back in line with our constitution and divine institutional thinking about government. Let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to talk about the Urim Oath. You've, you may have never heard of that before. I don't know. Primarily, it's Old Testament, and so people <laughs> don't get that interested in it. But much of our constitutional beliefs and much of what we do in our court system comes off from the Mosaic Law concept because it was a perfect concept. It just needs to be modified to brought into whatever. Our Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet to study the spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it under carnality and evidence of carnality is personal sin. And I want to thank you personally, Father, for the wonderful grace way you've given us to deal with it in the church age. If we confess our sins, it could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins, or others. If we confess them, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and it restores us to the indwelling ministry, spirituality, work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And one of those is learning the Word of God. When we learn it under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, dear Father, we find that it develops truth in our life that sets us free from the cosmic system of lies, the world system run by the devil, 1 John 5, 19, of lies out to destroy everything that resembles God in a sane society. We thank you tonight, and I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would minister the truth tonight of the Urim Oath, that we might understand it in a more prevalent way, and then apply this concept to our own nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Caiaphas, in Matthew, the 26 chapters, we read it in our introduction, invoked the high priest Urim, Urim Oath. It is covered by the words, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? I want to talk about five things about the Urim Oath that we might understand as we deal with the historical passage. The Urim Oath was an oath associated with the Urim, 
which means light in Hebrew, and the thruim, which means per perfections. The I am on both of these words is important in Hebrew because they're plural. The I am is plural. <clears throat> these are not singular ideas, they're plural ideas. Kind of like Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. The I am on it makes the plurality or the Trinity or the Godhead in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy on your own will be a good read for you on this. You want to take a look at that, I suppose. But the Urim oath was an oath associated with the Urim and the Thuim of the breastplate worn by the high priest in judicial matters of the theocracy government, which they're back under. Good reading on this subject matter would be Exodus 2830. Leviticus 8.8, 8, Numbers 27.21, Exodus 19.6, 1 Samuel 30, 7 and 8. These are great readings on this subject matter if you're interested in biblical history. Before the monarchy, the period of the kings, before the, monarch, before the monarchy system was established, the Urim and the Thurim was very important for consulting answers of the most difficult national uh, judicial matters like in Deuteronomy 3, 33, 8 through 11. It's that's kind of gives you a very fast, quick footnote on what we're dealing with in the first century in the life of Christ. The second point I want to make to you is a Urim oath required everyone in court to speak the truth and only the truth, and everyone was held liable by God in judicial matters. And I don't mean a figure of, I don't mean a figure, I mean literally held liable to God. This is a theocracy form of government. I mean literally, not figuratively, literally held liable by God. Do you understand that? He is running the court system. He's running the court system. He's the head honcho of the court system. This is a theocracy, a God-governed body. And so this matter is a lot more important when we say it is symbolic. Do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Right? We're not a theocracy. We do that because we believe that God does appoint and rule. But we're, we're a republic. Right? We vote. Yeah, we vote. They were literally held liable by God. You think the high priest believes that? He, proved, he brought two false witnesses. He brought many more, but they couldn't hold up the, by his staff interrogating them. His staff interrogated him, couldn't even bring him into court because they couldn't stand up under examination. He finally found two that talked about the, that Christ would destroy the temple, which he was talking about the resurrection. Now, let me show you something interesting about this oath. Under the Urim oath, even demons understood they were held liable by God for speaking the truth. Watch this. I, we're in Matthew, so let's go over to Mark. Let's go to Mark in the fifth chapter, and that's a very famous demonic passage. This is the, the demonic man that lived in the graveyard, if you remember. You remember this guy, and uh, Mark 5, and we're going to pick this story up because I just want to pick part of it up to make my point about demons and this Urim Oath. Uh, the the demon-possessed man 
Verse 6, seeing Jesus from a distance ran up and bowed down before him. That's actually the demon inside the man that's in control that bows down before him. That's important you understand that. And crying out with a loud voice, he, the demon, speaking through the man, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high? My Bible says I implore. This is I adjure. This is our word. I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So Jesus asked, what is your name? And he said, my name is legions, for we are many. Inside one guy. This story goes on to say Jesus cast the legions of demons out, and they went into 2,000 pigs. You remember that story? The point I want to make to you is he called upon the Urim oath to Jesus Christ. He said, let's have a moment of truth here. He pleads his case before the high priest. He knows who's really the ruler of it all. What do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. If you want more information on that idea, don't, do not torment me, you go to Matthew. If you're interested, you go to Matthew 25, 41. Not now. Write it on your paper. That's where you go. What's he mean by don't torment me? Jay's going to spit in his face and slap him around, beat him up? No. No, he's not. What's this demon mean? It means that he was sentenced in eternity past to the lake of fire. Matthew 25, 41. Another story that's of great interest with this same idea is Acts. Now, this story in Acts 19 is an interesting story because we're in Ephesus. In 19, verses 13 through 16. And we run into the seven sons of Sevas, who is a high priest. And God has been doing unbelievable miracles through Paul. You can read about 11, 12. Verse 12, just, I mean, evil demons were being cast out like crazy and people were being healed. Verse 13, this is in Ephesus now. But some of the Jewish exorcists, the seven sons of Sevas, and Sevas was the high priest, who went from place to place attempting to name over those who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what they said, I adjure you. By Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I adjure you. The seven sons of one Sevas, a Jewish high priest, were doing this very thing. The evil spirit answered and said to them, the seven sons of Sevas, who were exorcists, I recognize Jesus and I know Paul but who are you? In other words, I know we're in power when I stand before divine authority. Jesus, I stood before Jesus and I stood before Paul, but who are you? I don't recognize you with any divine authority. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, 
subdued all of them, overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the Jews and the Greeks in Ephesus. Now, even the demonic world understands the authority of an oath like this. That they're liable to God. And you don't play around with this stuff under a theocracy. And yet here is the high supreme court of Israel in the day of Jesus Christ that makes a mockery of all of this. They use this Urim oath without any liability to God, not even themselves. And nothing could be farther from the truth. And they will all get it. They will all get it in the end. This liability before God will have its day. They'll have its day and time and eternity. Just interesting stuff. Talking about the Urim Point three. You can see the spiritual hypocrisy of the high priest in Sanhedrin in the use of the Urim Oath against Jesus. When the Urim Oath was given by the high priest, Jesus broke his silence. He had never spoken court, never once, until they pulled this out. When he pulled that out of the bag, Jesus broke his silence. And Jesus said, you have said it yourself. Finally, we have a point of truth in this entire trial that we're now in the second one of that's been a mockery before God. Finally, after all of this, we finally have the truth. A truth, a point of truth in this court. Nevertheless, I tell you, and he calls his two witnesses. He calls David and Daniel. Here at which who prophesied the first coming and the second coming of Christ. David prophesied the first coming, Daniel 7, the second. Therefore, the importance of, important, the importance of the words hereafter, hereafter, are really important. He calls David, who's covering the first advent of Christ, and he calls Daniel, who will cover the second advent of Christ, To court against the Supreme Court. He calls two witnesses against them and their mockery of divine justice. Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of, of power. That's Jesus is going to die on a cross. He's going to be buried, raised from the dead, go back to heaven and be seated uh, at the right hand of God the Father with all power. Agreed? Yeah. Of course. His first witness he called was David, and the first legal book he quoted from was the Bible. Something that they had thrown out of court. They had thrown the Bible out. They had thrown God with it. They don't have any more understanding of what they just said. They just used it as a ploy against innocent, an innocent man. And then he quotes, he brings Daniel before, and coming down the clouds of heaven is the second advent. And the Jews are connected with both of them. The crucifixion on Christ on the one side and the tribulation on the other side.
They never listened to the two witnesses he called. Jesus called two surprise witnesses to testify of the truth of him as the Son of Man. He called David and he called Daniel. He covered the first and the second coming, as we called it, or the Messiah for certain. Two of the great prophets of all prophets, he quotes. Point four. Jesus stated his word in such a manner that the court could discern the truth based on positive volition to the truth of God's word. In other words, he... He spoke these words in such a manner that if you were positive to the word of God, you would get it. And if you were negative to the word of God, it would have no meaning to you. It's like he did with parables. If they, if they, if they were open, positive to the word of God, if they were positive to God, this would be a great moment in their life. And he he spoke it in such a manner that gave an opportunity, listen, gave an opportunity to be saved, to rescue their lives. You have no idea what you men are doing. You have no idea how important this day is to your life in time and eternity. I wonder if we were in court if by now we wouldn't be burnt to a crisp with a bad attitude. Not, not only then, but at the end of this, when they just mock the whole judicial system of the priest nation of Israel. But you know what? God bless him. He kept his cool and stayed focused on his mission. That was to save people's souls. Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst, Paul said. Yeah, he was the worst. He was like these guys. Listen, he was part of this group. And Paul got saved. Jesus makes an appeal to them. He makes an appeal to the word of God. Do you believe David and Daniel? Have you thrown everybody under the bus? Have you thrown God out of Israel? You just invoked his name. Do you have any respect left in your souls? That's what the point is. I mean, do we make an appeal to people who we know we stand before them and they speak angry words and we know that there is hate in their heart? Do we still care for their souls? Do we just want to run over them with a bus? Do we, do we care for their soul? In this terrible, terrible moment in his life, he cares for their soul. He cares for their soul. Hmm. See, I find that hard. I want to do, I would want to do the right thing here. But I'm going to have to grow more. I mean, this is a great moment in, in the heart of his, of his humanity. In the heart of his humanity. I find this an extraordinary moment. I just find it extraordinary. The high priest response shows negative volition to the truth and negative volition to the Urim oath and negative volition to God Almighty. The high priest tore his judicial robe in anger, charged Jesus with blasphemy, and then physically assaulted him in court. The greatest court system ever, 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 ever. And the court in unanimous vote, declared he's, he deserves the death penalty. 
They spit in his face. They beat him with their fist and slapped him. And they mocked their own people's opinion of him as a prophet. But in Leviticus, the 10th chapter, verse 6 and 7, and in Leviticus, the 21st chapter, 10 through 15, you will read that it was forbidden by Mosaic law for the high priest to tear the judicial robe. That was God's job. The priest, the high priest didn't have the authority no more to tear his robe from the top to the bottom. Listen to me. From the top to the bottom than they would to tear the veil that stood between the holy place and the holies of holies. And that's just exactly what they did. You need to understand what they just did, what this high priest just did who was only permitted into the inner sanctuary because of the blood of Christ. He did what was forbidden. He tore the sacred judicial robe and he did it out of disrespect for God. And still Jesus cares for their soul. They humiliated him. They humiliated his father. They humiliated the greatest judicial system ever in mankind. And he still cares for their soul. Still wants them to have the best of God. Point number five. Jesus was charged with blasphemy. Listen. There is no greater crime under the theocracy rule than blasphemy against God. None. If you tried to think what would be the greatest crime in our, in our culture, it would probably be treason. Blasphemy was worse than that. There was no crime. This was a crime against God Almighty and everything he stood for and everything he had developed in the culture of the priest nation of Israel. Blasphemy. They charged an innocent man, not only the very begotten son of God, but an innocent man with blasphemy. If there was one man in all Israel that you couldn't get enough witnesses against on blasphemy, it would have been Jesus Christ. This corrupt group of politicians in control of the theocracy judicial system of God Almighty charged the very son of God himself with blasphemy. The worst. And you know what they would have done? They would have, if they would have been in rule, they would have tacked on top of that cross, blasphemer. But Pilate wouldn't let him. Pilate wouldn't let him. Instead, Pilate nailed up there the king of kings. This group of people hated it. This group of people hated it. And it was the truth. They hated it because they hated the truth. Boy, when you hate the truth of God, what's left for you? When there is no light in your soul at all, when there is no light, no light of consciousness to God, when that light shuts down, you're in a pretty bad, dark place. And if you're listening to me today on the Internet and you think you can do whatever you want with God, I'll tell you, you're in serious, serious trouble. You don't have authority over God. 
But I'm going to tell you something. He has authority over you. And if you don't learn it in this life, you will learn it in the next, and it'll be too late to do anything about it. It's not too late to do something about it now. When you turn the lights off in your soul on God, there is no hope. And this group of people had long done that. They were trying to shut it off on other people's life. You can never afford to have these kind of people run your judicial system, and we've got them. And we should hit our knees and pray every day that God will take these people out of our offices and put godly people in them, people that have respect for God Almighty and the laws of divine establishment, care about innocence. Jesus was charged with the worst possible crime you could ever have in Israel under a theocracy government by this corrupt high priest and the court of the Sanhedrin, the supreme court of the priest nation of Israel who has just rejected Jesus as their Messiah. John talks about it in John 1, 11 through 13, how he came to his own and his own, own received him not. Here is one you should read, not now, but on your own. Circle John 11, 47, 55, and see the motive behind this court. Listen, this court was rigged long before Christ got before it. John 11, 47 through 55 really gives you insight. Here's another one. Matthew 21, 33 through 41 is the parable of the landowner. It is in that parable that Jesus in verse 38 says that when the, when the people, when he sent his son to the people, they said, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. That's this group. That is this group that we're before today in this court. In verse 43 of that parable, he said, the kingdom of heaven will be taken from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And verse 46 is important because it says, the Sanhedrin, when they heard these words, hated it, but they feared the people, listen to me, because they the populace believed Jesus was a prophet. Now that verse 46 is going to become important to our passage of Scripture where they mock him as a prophet. Prophesize to us, Jesus, O oh, prophet of the people, tell us who just slapped you, who just hit you in the head from behind. My, my. Terrible. Yes. And wanted to see yes. If he could yes. They blindfolded him. Leprosy or yep. Other evil. Yep. Thinking. Yep. They blindfolded him. They charged Jesus with blasphemy because of negative volition towards the truth of God's word, even God himself. No respect for God himself. I worry about us in America today. I worry about the church. I worry about the church. That's under my care. I worry about it. Just think you can live your life any way you want to, and it's my life. I'll live it the way I want. Uh, no, you can't, because it's not your life. You've been bought with a price. You've been bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20. Your life's not your own. Now, you're going to be happy about that when you die and go to heaven. But what are you going to do in the meantime? Oh, well, that's a good question. Hmm? That ought to be a serious question in your heart. You see, the irony is that this court was guilty of the very charge 
that they issued against Jesus. And Jesus was innocent, and they're not. They're guilty of their charge they gave him. Huh. They, ought to, they ought to read their law books a little more about when you charge somebody uh, of a crime that you're guilty of. They should have read the law books because they're in deep trouble. Uh, so how do we apply this to our life? Church age believers must be reminded that like Jesus, we are subject to false accusation and undeserved suffering for the sake of Christ. It is Philippians 1.29 when we learn of such, such situations as Jesus is in in our own life when we're falsely accused and we suffer for the sake of Christ. When he wrote, for it is to you, Paul wrote, that it's been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him but to suffer for his sake. You can read more about that idea and you would be wise to because you're a believer. 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 9 through 13, Acts 13, 44 through 46, and a good one, Revelation 2, 8 through 10, and James 1, 2 through 4, and verse 12, in regard to the crown of life. And then 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. Now I want you to, I want to give you a little home Bible, something to play with. Instead of sitting around the TV and getting upset. Instead of watching the 6 o'clock news and just wanting to eat your arm off. Maybe use it as a study Bible. Mm -hmm. Here, here's how it reads. It comes most often, undeserved suffering, comes most often from religious communities and also apostate churches. I get, I get more attack from the church than I ever do from the world. world don't care a hoot about me. <laughs> world doesn't care. And if they knew how small we were, they probably wouldn't care about me either. But let me tell you, grace is a great, grace threatens people. It, it, it threatens them once they get a hold of it. It either brings them in or be, they become your enemy. Grace. Now, the book of Galatians is your home study because the book of Galatians is going to show you this warfare in the church. And so I, I focused on each chapter a little study for you about grace the liberty of grace in the life of a believer of a church. And uh, it's just to give you something to focus on because you will be, the book of Galatians talks about being persecuted from within the body of Christ. So, you know, it's a, it's a very simple study, and it would be good for you just to give you something to look at and give you some guidelines on a little study to look at some ideas and uh, to pay attention to the book. I took an, an excerpt out of each chapter of the book of Galatians because that's what the book of Galatians is about. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll have a short season after we dismiss the Internet for our own, own church. Father, we're so thankful tonight. For those who have attended our study with us from the book of Matthew 26, I thank you, Father, for these that have attended with us from the Internet and those who have drove in. I am thankful for the Internet people because they're from all over the world and all over the United States, and we're thankful for that. But as a face-to-face -face teacher, I'm always interested in those who drive in to Bible study because it shows a, a great deal of commitment and it shows me who are becoming one-minded and like-minded about the grace gospel. And for me, I need that as well as the Internet. <clears throat> I need that. 
And so those, Father, that are in the Birmingham periphery that would normally drive 25, 30 minutes to get a good steak or to get a good deal at a clothing store or drive to visit a friend in the hospital. Get out of your comfort zone. Get in your car and come here and be part of a, an assembly of, of people who show a real interest in the teaching of the Word of God. So let me encourage you with that. And for this, Father, we thank you tonight for what we've had. We thank you for this meal. In Jesus' name, amen.